The Farmhouse I go to college approximately one hour from home. Due to this luxury, I go back home on weekends once or twice a month. My dad is a worrier and advised me to always stick to the main roads. He said a cute 19-year-old girl should be wise and do all they can to avoid getting stranded out in the middle of nowhere. I usually took that advice. Well, sometimes I did. Okay, actually I rarely took that advice. I'm not the best driver in the world and expressways make me nervous. I don't like driving at high speeds and having other cars zooming past me at 90 miles per hour makes me break out in a cold sweat. I am much more comfortable and relaxed taking quiet back roads when I travel, so I never mention to my dad that as long as the weather is decent, I take serene routes. I departed from school on a Friday evening. It had been a beautiful day. The sun was beaming, the birds were chirping, and even though the sky was getting dark, there was a bright full moon out that made it feel almost like daytime. Thirty minutes into my trip, a monstrous storm snuck up on me. The blackened sky crept over the full moon, casting a dreary blanket of darkness over everything. The wind began to whistle and started to push my little hatchback all over the road. When the rain started, the trouble really began. I swear, it was as though an army of people dumped hundreds of buckets of water on my windshield all at once. My pathetic windshield wipers couldn't keep up and my vision was a complete blur. This coinciding with the fact that I happened to be on a thin, winding road caused me to go skidding off into a ditch. My passenger side front and rear tires were sunk deep into the oozing mud. They spun and spun when I hit the accelerator, but my car wouldn't budge. I was stuck, and I was stuck good. I pulled out my cell phone. I would have preferred to have called some friends, but none of them were within reasonable driving distance. I had no choice but to call my dad and get an earful that was probably warranted. As I dialed the number, I was notified that I was out of signal range. And there I was, a cute 19-year-old girl, stranded in the middle of nowhere just as my father had warned. I sat there for several minutes contemplating what to do. As I looked blankly ahead, coming up with no good plan, I noticed a light blink on not too far away. I stared out for a good minute before I realized there was a house right across the street. Perhaps they had a phone I could use. I jumped from my lopsided car and darted up the inclined driveway toward the house that sat atop a modest hill. It was an old two-story farmhouse. The wood siding was dark and weathered from age. The railing that wrapped around the covered porch appeared warped. As I looked up at the roof, which was missing several shingles, I noticed that one of the windows on the second floor had bars on it. It made me wonder if this was some kind of an institution, but it couldn't be. I mean, it was obviously just an old farmhouse. I rushed to the shelter of the front porch, brushed my soaked hair from my eyes, and stepped up to the front door. The door was thick and solid and held a large, intimidating cast-iron door knocker in the shape of a wolf's head. I grabbed the big knocker and thudded it against the door a few times and waited. It was less than a minute later when the big door slowly creaked open. Standing before me was a small, meek girl who looked to be about ten years old. She was pale and her long black hair was tied back into a ponytail. She wore a straight, plain black dress that would have made Wednesday Adams proud. She spoke softly. Yes? I am sorry to bother you, but my car is stuck in the ditch. Do you have a phone I can use? Her stoic expression never changed as she spoke. Of course. Please come in out of the wet. I stepped into the house that appeared to have the same decor as it likely had 100 years ago. Sturdy antiques were the furniture of choice. The walls were adorned with several old black and white photos, and the worn wooden floor looked original. 
but with all that being said, the place was clean and well kept. Thanks a lot, I really appreciate I hadn't finished my sentence when the young girl held a finger up to her dry lips and continued to speak in a reserved, docile voice. Shh. My brother Gabriel is upstairs sleeping. You wouldn't want to wake him. She motioned for me to step into the front room, which consisted of a Victorian-style couch and matching chairs. A large stand-up radio was positioned against the far wall, in the place most people nowadays would have put a TV. The girl led me to a primitive black rotary phone that sat on the end table next to the couch. Help yourself, but please, keep your voice down. I gave her a smile and picked up the phone. Instead of a dial tone, I heard a recorded voice say, No service. Please try again later. It's not working. The pale girl put her ear to the phone and nodded. Sometimes the phones go out during a storm. You're welcome to wait until it passes. She gestured toward the couch. I thanked her in a whisper and sat down. I figured I didn't have much choice. Would you like something while you wait? I shook my head. No, no, I'm fine, thank you. Apparently, the young girl was not taking no for an answer. I'll return with some hot chocolate and a snack. The gloomy girl disappeared down the hallway, leaving me alone. I gazed about the room and my eyes were drawn to an ornate wood-carved cuckoo clock in the center of the wall. It was spectacular. The story told through the carving seemed to be Little Red Riding Hood. There were lots of carved wolf heads and young ladies in hooded cloaks. It wasn't long before my hostess returned with a mug of hot chocolate and a can of sardines that she took the liberty to open for me. The thought of eating one of the sardines made me want to puke, but the little girl, who was starting to give me a creepy vibe, was staring at me as if waiting to make sure I was satisfied. I did my best to act, please. Oh boy! sardines. I removed one of the dead fish from the container and made a point not to look at it. I politely stuffed it in my mouth, held my breath as I chewed, and swallowed it down. Mmm! I was hoping that my face wasn't giving off a sickly shade of green because I felt slightly nauseous by the fact that I just ingested that salty thing. The girl pointed to the mug in front of me. Sardines go well with hot chocolate. I nodded politely, picked up the mug, and took a sip of the so-called hot chocolate. First of all, it was lukewarm at best. Secondly, it wasn't sweet. It tasted like it was made from baking chocolate. It was a lot thicker than I would expect hot chocolate to be as well, but at least it washed out the horrible aftertaste of the sardine. Is there anything else I can get for you? I quickly shook my head. No, no, this is plenty, thank you. At that moment, a plump older woman entered the room. She wore a dress that was mostly covered by her food-stained apron. Her dark hair was sprinkled with gray, and dark circles had found a home under her eyes. She stared at me and began looking me up and down before speaking with a concerned tone. Oh dear. She leaned over and spoke quietly to the young girl. Is Gabriel home? Yes, mother. He hasn't seen her yet, has he? No, mother. Gabriel is still asleep. The mother let out a relieved breath. Oh, good. Good. It was at that time that I started getting very uncomfortable and anxious. Not only did I now feel like I was intruding, I felt like I was possibly in danger. I really don't want to be a bother. I think I'll wait in my car until the storm passes. The mother's gaze moved from me to the staircase near the front door that winded into the darkness of the second floor. She spoke while still peering up the stairs. Perhaps that would be best. I was in full agreement as I got up and headed for the door. As I reached for the front doorknob, I was startled when the door burst open and a man in his late fifties quickly stepped in out of the rain. 
He was wearing an oil-stained baseball cap and a dirty lambskin bomber's jacket. He appeared as shocked to see me as I was to see him. Who the hell are you? My nerves began to overwhelm me and I could feel my hands begin to tremble. Uh, I, my, my, my car. The man rushed past me and I could hear him confronting the woman and the girl. What the hell is she doing here? The young girl's stone expression and stoic tone never changed as she attempted to explain. Her car is stuck outside. The man was livid. He spoke in a sharp whisper, clearly attempting to keep his voice down. I don't care. You know you can't have a young woman like this anywhere near Gabriel. Is his door bolted? The little girl shook her head. Well, get up there and bolt it! Hurry! The girl moved swiftly up the stairs. Shortly after, she disappeared into the darkness of the second floor. The clanging of metal could be heard. This was followed by the deep voice of a male who I presumed to be Gabriel. Hey, what are you doing? The pale girl hurried back down the steps and reported to the man. I bolted the door, but Gabriel is now awake. The man turned his attention to me. His face was full of fear. We have to get you out of here. As the man rushed toward me, I could hear Gabriel upstairs. He was pounding on the door and spoke in a deep growl. Let me out. The man opened the front door and pushed me outside into the storm while turning and snapping at the woman and the girl one final time. You two must be crazy to let a young woman inside on the night of a full moon. No sooner had the words left the man's voice when I heard the bone-shaking, guttural growl of a beast coming from that room upstairs. The man raced outside with me and then stopped, grabbed me by the upper arms and shouted at me so that he could be heard loud and clear over the downpour of the rain and the roar of thunder. Get into your car. Don't get out no matter what. I'm going to pull you out of that ditch. As soon as you're clear, get out of here. Do you hear me? Drive away and don't look back. Girls your age are his favorite meal. He'll stop at nothing to get you. Do you understand? He'll stop at nothing. The man gave me a shove toward the road as he darted off in a different direction toward a large truck at the end of the driveway. I couldn't help but scream as I ran down the driveway into the street and to my imprisoned car. Just before I opened the door and I jumped in, I turned my head over my shoulder and looked up at the second floor of the house and at that window that had the bars over it. An ominous light appeared in the room and I could see the hulking silhouette of a hairy beast gripping the iron bars and shaking them with fury. My screams were overpowered by a deafening, raucous howl. I jumped into my car, slammed the door shut, and locked the doors. As I did this, the man's truck zoomed up in front of me. He rapidly fastened a chain to the front of my car and began trying to pull me out of the ditch. I watched on in horror as the big truck's back wheels began to spin fruitlessly. My car was not moving an inch. As the revving of the truck's engine filled the stormy night, it was eclipsed by the ravenous roar of the werewolf. I made the mistake of looking up at the window on the second floor again and witnessed the iron bars buckling under the werewolf's strength and begin bending apart. The man's cautionary statement echoed through my mind. He'll stop at nothing! He'll stop at nothing! Suddenly I felt a staggering jolt and all at once my car was freed from the muck and sitting on the road. The man jumped out of his vehicle, removed the chain and waved me on. Go! 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 I floored it toward the full moon that was peeking through a momentary break in the storm clouds and didn't slow down until the booming howl of the werewolf disappeared in the distance behind me.